Income Tax 2023-2024, Small Business, How to Pay Income Tax. Get ready, some coffee, and stay calm, because as a taxpayer, you really don't have much more to lose. So just relax. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the Form 1040 Tax Year 2023 Instructions Section Tax and Credits, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're going to focus on the tax before credits and other taxes here. Noting that the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here we have income minus various deductions resulting in the taxable income. The taxable income therefore being basically the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. However, it's not, of course, the bottom line of our entire income tax formula. We've only got basically half the battle here. We then have to calculate the tax on it. Think about the credits, the payments to get to the bottom line, the refund or the tax due. Now note that as we have set up our courses and our sections, we've tried to basically go from top to bottom of the formula. In other words, looking and expanding on the problems and details of the income line item, then the adjustments to income, then the standard deductions, the itemized deductions, and so on. However, we had to start off by giving an idea of the progressive tax system itself versus a flat tax system because that's kind of fundamental to our uh, entire tax system. And we need to have those concepts in place when looking at each line item such as uh, the income line item, for example. So we touched on some of these concepts for the calculation of uh, the taxes in prior courses or sections that you might want to review. We're going to touch on some of those concepts a little bit more here and expand on a few more items that could add some complexity uh, to it as well. So once we get to the taxable income, the next thing we need to do is, of course, calculate the tax on it, which you would think would be fairly easy if it were a flat tax. But as we know, it's not a flat tax. It's a progressive tax system. And therefore, we have to have that whole progressive tax calculation, which, again, we touched on in detail in prior sections or courses. Uh, but obviously, tax software will help us uh, with that calculation. We need to conceptually understand what a progressive tax system is, though, because we want to double check what the software is doing, number one. And number two, we want to be able to make projections into the future, which we have to have an understanding of the difference between what is like the marginal tax rate and the average tax rate. And we want to be able to explain this stuff, of course, to uh, clients and be able to understand it ourselves for rational decision making related to the taxes. Not only do we have to apply a uh, tax rate that is progressive, however, we also have some income subject to different tax rates, usually more favorable tax rates. Those could include things like qualified dividend income, as well as long term capital gain income that we need to take into consideration. Once we do all that, we can hopefully calculate the tax before credits and other taxes, which the tax software, again, is very useful uh, in calculating. Then we need to take into consideration tax credits and other taxes. We'll get into credits later, but remember that those are similar to deductions in that they are both good. However, 
if we had a dollar deduction and a dollar credit and we can only take one or the other, we would rather have the dollar credit because the dollar credit gives us the full dollar benefit, whereas the dollar deduction just decreases the taxable income. And then other taxes, one of the big ones that we've looked at is, say, self-employment tax, for example. Remembering that the Form 1040 is usually what we think of as just the federal income taxes, but we could have other taxes calculated on it, such as Social Security and Medicare, which could be in the form of the the uh, self-employment tax and that gives us our total tax we're still not done though because it's not like we wait till the end of the year and then calculate our total tax and pay it all to the government in one lump sum no the government wants to be paid during the year as the year goes in the form of w-2 withholdings or estimated tax payments and if the tax return was not so complex then what would happen is we would pay exactly the proper amount of taxes during the year and the form 1040 would just be an information type form telling the IRS look this is what we owed and we already paid you however the tax return is way too complex to do that therefore we shoot to overpay with with withholdings and estimated tax payments why so we don't get hit with the stick of penalties and interest not just so we can get a refund we're trying to avoid getting hit with the sticks, metaphorically. And then we also have the, the refundable tax credits. We'll get into credits later, what's refundable and what's non-refundable. But that is what finally gets us to the tax refund or the tax that is due. Okay, this is the second page of the Form 1040. We're looking at line 16, tax, see instructions, check if any forms apply. So these forms might not always apply, but we have these check boxes that we'll basically touch in on here. That's for the Form 8814, Form 4972, which apply in certain circumstances. So check on your taxable income, figure the tax using one of the methods described later. We'll talk about that shortly in terms of applying the tax calculation where we will typically use a formula to apply it or possibly tax tables. So tax forms 8814 relating to election to report child's interest or dividends. So that's going to be this form. So we touched about this concept uh, in our income section, that basically being that uh, we might have dependents, and if we have our dependents, they might have some income. And if you have more wealthy individuals, they might be more likely to give uh, passive income to the dependents. Now, the tax code is going to be, of course, skeptical of doing this because they don't want people to do this in order to try to reduce the taxes of the parent. In other words, you might say, hey, look, there's a progressive tax system. That means that my first dollars are going to be taxed lower than my later dollars. So what I'm going to do as a parent is I have some extra money I would like to invest. So I will give it to my child and my child, because they don't have any other income, will be taxed at lower progressive tax rates, whereas my marginal tax rates are higher. You could see why the IRS would be skeptical of that. Uh, and, and therefore, you have different rules with regards to does the dependent child have to file a different tax return? And if so, do they have to use the tax rate of the parents uh, on uh, the dependent tax return so that you don't end up in this situation where there's a tax benefit to give money to the child just so they can take advantage of the lower tax brackets? Or can we file if they have dividend and income, uh, interest income, could we put that on the parent's uh, tax return? So that's kind of the question there. We touched on that on the income section. And uh, so you can also find that in more detail on the IRS website, that tax form. We've got the tax form 4972 relating to lump sum distributions. This being from like a retirement plan, like a 401k plan or uh, other retirement plan. Then we have tax with respect to section 962 election, election made by domestic shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation to be taxed at corporate rates. So obviously that would be a very kind of specific situation if you had a controlled foreign corporation. Uh, remember as a tax preparer, the question would be, if that is a situation, is that a tax client that I want to be taking on? Is it an, an area that I can specialize in? And if not, 
then you have to be able to say no to particular clients, which a lot of people have uh, difficulty doing uh, sometimes, including me. So reduce the amount of any foreign tax credits claimed on Form 1118, uh, C Section 962 for details, check box three and enter the amount uh, and 962 in the space next to that box, attach a statement showing uh, you figured your tax, how you figured it. All right, so here's just a screenshot of the form 8814. This is the parent's election to report child's interest and dividends. You can, of course, check that out, do more research on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. This is just a screenshot of the form 4972. That's the tax on lump sum distribution that we just took a look at from qualified plans and participants born before uh, January 2nd, 1936. This is the instructions for Form 1118. So that's the foreign tax credit for corporations, which again, you could find those on the IRS website if applicable to you. Do a more research from there. Okay, recapture of education credit. So you may owe this tax if you claimed an education credit in an earlier year and either tax-free educational assistance or a refund of qualified expenses was received in 2023 for the student. So we'll talk about credits more later. The education tax credit being, of course, one of them. It could be a substantial credit. One of the issues being, and we've touched on some of these similar issues when we talked about, say, income uh income areas such as a, a state, let's say like you had the, the state uh, refund, for example, which you might have got a benefit for in the prior in the prior year, and now they gave you a refund on it. And so what do you do in the current year? And usually the question is, uh, do I have to go back into the prior year and amend the tax return, which I don't want to have to do, or do I include it in income in the current year so that I can go in the current year moving forward. Typically what the IRS wants to be able to do is when you have these somewhat common situations where you might have gotten a refund in the current year for a deduction that you basically over deducted in the prior year to take care of it in the current year instead of amending the prior year. All right, so you can see form 8863 for more details, check box three and enter the amount and ECR and the space next to that box. So any tax from form 8621 line 16E related to section 1291 fund, check box three and enter the amount of the tax and 1291 tax and the space next to that box. I'll show that possibly a screenshot of that form in a second, a uh, tax from form uh, 8978, line 14, relating to partners audit liability under section 6226, check box three and enter the amount of liability. Again, that would probably only be happening for specific types of clients uh, and might not be the thing that comes up as much for most say tax preparers. And if it does, Again, that's one of those clients that you want to be thinking, are those the types of clients that I want to be picking up, focusing in on, or possibly specializing in? So here's just a screenshot of the instructions for Form 8863. That's the education credits, uh, American Opportunity and Lifetime credits, which of course you can find on the IRS website. This is the instructions for Form 8621, information return for shareholder of a passive foreign investment company or qualified uh electing fund, which again, you would think would be somewhat of a special type of situation. Here are the instructions for form 8978, including section A, partners additional reporting year uh, for use with form 8978, which you could find on the IRS website. All right, so do you want to use the IRS figure, the tax on your taxable income for you? So possibly in certain situations, you might have the IRS figure the tax for you. However, oftentimes these days we have software to basically help with that. So I would think that that's often uh, what many people will end up doing. Uh, you might think about it this way. If you have a very basic uh, type of tax return, you just have like W-2 income, then possibly you might have a situation where you can have the IRS uh, figure it for you. Any more complexity in the tax return I would think it might be useful to be using 
some kind of software which you can get basically for free oftentimes because if you look at the IRS websites and we've looked at this in prior courses or sections, there's often a free file option where certain uh, software companies will provide will provide software to do calculations if your income is below a certain threshold. So I would think for most people, that's possibly the best way to go because that software will give you a a interview instruction format to help ask questions so that you can basically make sure that you're populating the return correctly. You would think that if your income was low, the tax return would be easier to do, but oftentimes it may not be because we have these credits that are acting and using the tax system as a kind of benefit or welfare program. So in other words, things like the earned income tax credit for low income individuals and the child tax credit are often some of the most complex type of credits that we have to calculate and have the a lot of moving parts to them. So so I would think that uh, you you'd basically want to use the software even if you're on the low income side of things and uh, and possibly be able to use it for free. If your income is higher than the threshold to be able to use the free software, then I would think that you wouldn't want clearly wouldn't want the IRS doing any calculation of your taxes that probably wouldn't be able to uh, because your tax return is going to be somewhat complex at that point in time. And I think it would be well worth paying for the software at that time so that you at least have that interview process or possibly at that point think about hiring someone to do the tax return help you like a CPA firm more than possibly like a small uh, a small a, a tax preparer that just cranks out tax returns because th at that point your income is getting high enough that you might want tax planning to be involved not just tax preparation or you're going to be going towards that in the future so you possibly want to be hiring someone that can give you actually advice about what is happening okay so yes, uh, see chapter 13 of publication 17. So you can find that publication on the IRS website for details, including who is eligible and what to do. So if you have paid too much, you will send you a, a refund. If you don't pay enough, we will send you a bill. Okay, no use one of the following methods to figure your tax. All right, so we're going to usually be using one of these methods to figure the tax. However, we're typically not doing it by hand. And note that a lot of these instructions they're still kind of the IRS is still kind of geared into the old mindset as though we're doing tax returns by hand. So you've got to think that things kind of move slow uh, over time when the tax when it used to be when you had to get the taxes and actually get the forms like at the post office or something like that. Then, of course, the incentive to make things as efficient as possible was to try to make everything fit on one form. That's why you have this situation where instead of having separate tabs, which makes more sense, and we started to move to when you have a computer program, they tried to have multiple forms so that people could just pick the correct form that applies to them with as simple a process as possible that fits on one form. But now, of course, we have, we have software, much of which is, is free for people that are under a certain income threshold. So, so that's why basically we've limited the number of forms and are instead using schedules, which makes more sense to, to add complexity to a form because it's not like you have to enter another paper form. And the calculation of the tax uh, is not something that is transparent to us now because we're typically not doing it by hand with schedules and worksheets, looking up tables, but rather are using the software to do it. So, so for most people, you're going to be using some kind of software and the software is going to be helping us with uh, the calculation, but we still want to understand what the software is doing, the methods that it's using and how the calculations are working so that we can explain them to people and so that we can, we can make projections into the future as income changes. So if your taxable income is less than 100,000, you must use the tax table uh, later in this uh, instruction to figure your tax. So in other words, software will typically do this, right? It's gonna default if you're under 100,000 to using the tax tables. Now the tax tables are still using the progressive tax system where 
you have a certain amount of income that's going to be taxed at the lower tier, like 10%, and then the next amount of your income is taxed at 15%, the next amount of your income taxed at 20 and so on and so forth. But instead of doing that with a formula, they're, they're, they've already pre-calculated everything so that you can look at a table, basically, and figure out your filing status, which is you know single, head of household, married filing joint, married filing separate, and your income level to then find the the proper column and row and that'll give you the the number so even when you had the table it doesn't give you any more like transparency in how the system works because you don't really see how the table was constructed the kit the table was constructed based on the progressive tax system where we're being taxed in those tier levels that's what you need to know for projections into the future because that'll help you give you your average tax versus your marginal tax rates. All right, be sure be sure to use the correct column. If your table uh, income is 100,000 or more, use the tax computation worksheet. So in other words, they built the tables uh, up to $100,000, which most people uh, will fit into. If you're over the $100,000, then you have to use a tax calculation, which is actually a little bit more transparent because then the 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 tax calculation worksheet will basically show you a little bit more of of the structure of the progressive tax system which we looked at in prior in prior sections or courses however i uh, don't use the tax table or tax computation worksheet to figure your tax if any of the following applies form 8615 form 8615 must generally be used to figure the tax on your earned income over 2,500 if you are under 18 and certain uh, certain situations if you are older. So we, so this is the form 8615. Uh, Here's just a look at it. Tax for certain children who have uh, earned have unearned income. So once again, we have this kind of situation. You would think that that income is fairly low, like 2,500. But remember what we're talking about here is unearned income. So that is income from usually like interest and dividends. So in other words, you, you, you'd have to get a fairly substantial return still to have income of 2,500 that was generated from investments in say bonds, which pay, pay interest or stocks, which are typically going to be paying dividends. So that's why usually this kind of thing is something that's going to be happening possibly for larger, uh, higher income level people, because most people, when they save their money, they're, they're usually going to be putting their money into some type of tax saving. Most people are going to be tight on money, most average people, right? So the savings that they have for retirement, they're usually going to be putting into some kind of retirement plan, like a 401k plan or an IRA or something like that. And that's going to take a lot of their most of their extra cash and they're going to put it in there because they get a tax benefit from it those investments still being in like stocks and bonds but because it's under the umbrella of an ira or 401k plan or 403b they're not going to be taxed on it until uh until they take it out that's the benefit that's the deal uh, but uh, if they have some extra money over the threshold that they couldn't put into that plan then they might still put other money into stocks and bonds as normal investments, in which case the earnings of unearned revenue, interest and dividends would be taxable when they earn it. So in those cases, they might have enough money to give money to their children so the children could invest in the stocks and the bonds, which could be a good just learning tool for children, which is great. So they can have some earned income. If that were the case, they probably wouldn't have earned income over the 2,500. But again, the IRS is going to be skeptical of people using that as a tax strategy because the higher income individuals are at higher uh, tax rates. If you're looking at a progressive tax system, than the children. And so now you have the situation of, again, do the children's have to be subject to the parents' tax rate and so on and so forth. And then of course, if that's the case, are, do they still qualify as like dependents? Okay, so usually they're for higher income individuals, but you must file form 8615 if you meet all of the following conditions. So you had more than $2,500 of unearned income, such as taxable 
uh, interest, ordinary dividends, or capital gains, including capital gain distributions. You are required to file a tax return. You were either under the age of 18 at the end of 2023. So in other words, we're talking about the, the children, right? Under the age uh, of 18, they've got this unearned income. If, it's, if, it's, uh, if you had more than 2,500, then you might have to basically file uh, your, your own tax return and have this form 8615, possibly requiring them to then not have the, their own tax rate, progressive tax rates, but possibly be taxed at the parents' tax rates. So they were under the age 18 at the end of 2023, age 18 at the end of 2023, and didn't have earned income that was more than half of the support or uh, a full-time student at least age 19. So we're looking at these similar rules that were mirrored in the, 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 the dependents. Do they qualify as a dependent and so on? But under age 24, at the end of 2023, and didn't have earned income that was more than half of your support. So at least one of your parents was alive at the end of 2023. You didn't file a joint return. So you weren't married filing joint. All right. A child born on January 1st, 2006 is considered to be age 18 at the end of 2023. So whenever we have these cutoff dates, we have the question of what happens if we're on the edge of the cutoff date. So this is addressing that a child born on January 1st, 2005 is considered to be age 19 at the end of 2023. And a child born on January 1st, 2000 is considered to be age 24 at the end of 2023. Uh, 2023. All right, Schedule D tax worksheet. All right, so the Schedule D is typically going to be uh, related to the capital gains. And you will recall that when calculating the tax, we have the ordinary income tax rate, but we might have favorable tax rate for capital gains for things that were held longer than a year, typically for ordinary income people, that being applied to uh, the stocks the stocks that uh, could be sold. So, so again, tax software usually very helpful for us breaking out the income subject to ordinary gain rates and the income subject to more favorable rates such as uh, the Schedule D. So this is another one of those things that many tax preparers aren't very good at explaining because they don't really calculate it. What they're calculating is the taxable income, letting the software then calculate the tax. But we need to be able to understand it so we can one, check that the software is doing it properly and two, be able to understand and plan for the tax benefits of possibly having more favorable rates for investments in things like qualified dividends, have a similar thing or, uh, or capital gains versus ordinary incomes from stocks and bonds, for example. All right, you schedule D uh, tax worksheet in the instructions for schedule D to figure the amount to enter on form 1040-1040-SR line 16 if you have a have to file Schedule D and line 18 or 19 of Schedule D is more than zero or you have to file form uh, 4952 and have an amount on line 4G even if you don't need to file the Schedule D. But if you are filing Form 2555 dealing with foreign income, you must use the foreign earned income tax worksheet instead. So here's instructions for the Form 2555 foreign earned income. Noting, once again, foreign earned income is going to complicate things. You could be a tax preparer who specializes in people that have foreign earned income. Or you could be one saying, that's not what I do if you have foreign earned income then I'm not going to be taking you on because you're outside of the scope of my business plan. Here's some recommendations possibly to take someone, someone else can pick it up and you'll get people. Well, you, what you can't use to, you're not smart enough to do that return. It's like, no, it's not about, it's not, don't, don't try to bait me, man. I ain't getting, I ain't getting into this with you right now. <laughs> anyway, qualified dividends and capital gains tax worksheet. So use the qualified dividends and capital gains tax worksheet later to figure your tax uh, if you don't have to use the Schedule D tax worksheet and if any of the following applies. Uh, you report qualified dividends on Form 1040 or 1040SR. So remember that the qualified dividends is the other one that has income 
that is at favorable rates possibly and therefore needs to be broken out from the taxable income so that we can apply not the ordinary income progressive tax rates, but a whole different series of basically progressive tax rates which are favorable for the qualified dividends. Qualified dividends, as we talked about on the income side of things, typically being something that's trying to benefit investments in local uh, corporations, right? So, so that's why you get the tax benefit. So you report qualified dividends on Form 1040 or 1040SR. You don't have to file Schedule D and you report capital gain distributions on Form 1040 or 1040SR Line 7. Uh, you are filing Schedule D and Schedule D line 15 and 16 are both more than zero. But if you are filing Form 2555 for foreign income, you must uh, use the foreign earned income tax worksheet instead. Schedule J, if you had income from farming or fishing, farming or fishing, often specialized type of areas, areas where certain people could specialize in, possibly do quite well, because they're quite different. But if you don't want to specialize in those, remember that you, you want to uh, see who what plants you're looking to pick up and which you're not. So including certain amounts received in connection with the Exxon Valdez litigation, your tax may be less if you choose to figure it using income averaging on Schedule J. So foreign earned income tax worksheet. If you claim the foreign earned income exclusion, housing exclusion or housing deduction on form, there's that good old 2555 we've been referencing. You must figure your tax using the foreign earned uh, income tax worksheet. Again, software can help us with those situations. So here's the foreign earned income tax worksheet. I won't go into it in detail, but you can find that in the instructions as well.